Thank you. So I've always liked life. <laughs> it's kind of a vague statement, but, but it's true. I think as a kid I saw it as a, kind of an equation. You know, life is better than no life. So that meant certain things. It meant I, I couldn't pick dandelions on the playground because that would kill them. I actually wrote my college entrance essay about how I don't squish bugs in the house. My parents would see a silverfish running along the baseboard, they'd get a magazine, and I'd jump in at the last minute like a little action hero with my, uh, my paper cup and an envelope. No! And I'd catch the bug and put it outside so it could live. And I liked life so much that when it became time to decide what to do, I decided to become a biologist. That's what made sense in the moral equation. I should use my life to help sustain life. It's a very foolishly altruistic way to choose a career. But it's what you do when you're 18. You're like, I'm gonna be bad, just. So uh, when I was getting my PhD, I was working on designing new drugs for malaria. And one of the drugs I was working on started to look pretty good in the lab. It could kill the, the malaria parasite in a test tube very well. And so my advisor came to me and he said the words that I wished he would never say. He said, I think you need to begin animal testing. Now my stance on animal testing is probably the same as a lot of yours. I know it's necessary. I know that countless human lives have been saved because of animal testing, not to mention countless animal lives that could not have been saved without the veterinary vaccines and agricultural medicines that could only be developed by testing them on animals. I know this, but I never wanted to be the one to physically do the tests myself. And there's a name for this particular moral position. It's called hypocrisy. <laughs> and for most of us, it's, it's, it's an easy decision to make because it's just not gonna come up, is it? No one's gonna run into your office building on Monday and, and say, here, inject this into a rat. <laughs> and if they do, you call security. <laughs> because that's weird. But there I was having to face my own hypocrisy. And if I ever wanted this drug to end up in people, I had to test it in mice. So the first thing I did was a basic toxicity test. You see whether the drug itself is overtly toxic. And that involves taking four mice and, and uh, injecting the drug in different concentrations into the mice. Then you watch them for two weeks and you see if they die. And when they didn't die, I killed them. I harvested their organs, sectioned the organs, looked at them under the microscope. And that enabled me to write the sentence, gross pathology appeared normal. So that was that equation. You know, four mice for four words. And let me tell you, I have never been more uncomfortable in my life than when I've been labeling a rack of test tubes of formaldehyde, mouse one, lungs, mouse two, brain. And mouse one and mouse two are sitting over here looking at me like, what's that? What are you doing? What's going on? What's gonna be inside the tubes? I'm so sorry. I used to apologize to the mice while I was working with them, like it would make a bit of difference. Once the toxicity test was done, it was time for the real meat of the study, the efficacy test. And that's where you give the mice malaria and then give them the drug and see if they're cured. And long story short, the mice lived for nine days on my drug after getting malaria instead of five days, which is a it's a less than stellar result, I can tell you, because there are drugs that cure malaria. <laughs> so, you might wonder then, obvious question, why am I even working on new drugs? Well, first of all, it's because my advisor had a grant to do that. Uh, but also because there's resistance building up to the existing drugs all throughout the world, and so there's a constant need for new drugs coming out. But this drug, KNI-10283, this was not going to be it. So I thought I was done at this point. But my advisor had never before had a student who'd gone through the two months worth of rigmarole to get permission to work in an animal lab. So he wanted me to keep going. He said, well, what if you try the drug in higher concentrations? Hey, How about this, is, this guy needs medical help. Oh. This guy's passing out. Anybody doctor? Anybody doctor? Anybody doctor? Well, so that's a first. 
I hope you guys noticed what happened too, that when someone said, is anyone here a doctor? A room full of like 200 PhDs <laughs> all looked at each other like, no, I, I kind of, but uh. <laughs> I'm a doctor of astrophysics. No, it's not the same thing. <laughs> so I'm going to try to remember where I was there. <laughs> we were talking about mice, <laughs> I think. Yes, and, and uh, what had just happened, I believe, in the story was that um, I just finished the first test and it did not, did not go very well. Nine days instead of five days, that whole thing. And then my advisor... Uh, wanted to keep going. You know, he wanted to keep doing more and more mouse tests because he, he could now. And so he said, you know, what if you, what if you repeat this whole test but you do it with higher concentrations of drugs or lower concentrations of drugs, three times a day, twice a day, in combination with other drugs. And the next thing I knew, I was doing these larger and more and more complicated mouse studies using more and more mice. And at this point, the altruism was gone because I wasn't trying to solve malaria anymore. All I was doing, and I knew it, was just generating sentences for a journal article whose vague conclusion would be, chemical compounds of this class may show promise as anti-malarial drugs. Because that's what you do in early drug discovery. You don't actually help people. You just say, may show promise, and then you publish it, and then you go work on something else. In early dis drug discovery, you cannot be wrong. And that's why so many people do it. <laughs> so I kept working on, on these mice. And, and I, I hated it. I hated every aspect of it. I, I learned all kinds of things about the realities of working with mice. For example, when you're done with mice, when they survive the positive control mice, for example, and they survive your experiment, the pet, uh, pet store owner guy does not come in to collect them and take them off to homes. You just have nothing else to do with them. You have to euthanize them just because you have no more use for them. And so I actually had to euthanize mice. I would put them in a little Tupperware container and put in a hose with CO2 and turn on the gas and in about five minutes they'd all go down. And then I would put them in a red biohazard bag and put them in what had to be the worst smelling refrigerator on the planet because it was just full of dead mice. <laughs> and I, I felt so bad when I was euthanizing the mice, but then I thought, wait a minute, the mice that I am suffocating with carbon dioxide, these are the lucky ones. The unlucky ones are the ones who are dying over the course of nine days of malaria. I hated myself for doing this. And I kept thinking about that little boy who wouldn't pick dandelions on the playground and wondering how the hell did he grow up to do this? And I was thinking about this one morning when I was getting ready to go to work. I was in my crappy Baltimore row house where I was living. Uh, woo! <laughs> woo, crappy Baltimore. <laughs> and and I, was, I was getting ready to go to work. I, I was going to the bathroom. I was going to take a shower. But then before I did, I saw there was something in the toilet. It was a mouse. It was a big gray mouse. Uh, about a year ago, there was an episode of This American Life. Maybe some of you heard about a, a guy in Brooklyn who had a rat come in through the sewer pipes. This was nothing that dramatic. These were the mice that lived all throughout our house. They're the reasons we had to keep our cereal and Tupperware. And uh, this one had just fallen into the toilet bowl overnight, and I guess the sides were too slick and he couldn't get out. And when I got closer to the mouse, I noticed there was something a little unusual about the way he was swimming. He would actually go all the way under the surface of the water for like 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and then come up for just a second. So he was clearly drowning. He had been in there for a long time. And I thought, I kill these every day. I'm about to go to work and kill these now. I didn't know it yet, but by the end of my research, I would have killed 261 lab mice. But I thought, you know, if I could just save this one. I don't know, it was early in the morning, I wasn't awake yet, but these are the kind of things that go on. If I could just save this one, it might go some small measure toward reconnecting with my humanity. And I knew how to save it too, because it's the same way that I always used to save bugs. 
I just needed a really big cup. <laughs> so I went down to the recycling, and sure enough, there was a coffee can in there. So I got the coffee can and a big piece of cardboard. And I went up, and I scooped up the mice uh, or the mouse, and he was there sort of on the side of the horizontal coffee can. I got ready to clap the cardboard over the top. But as soon as he was in there, I realized I didn't have to do that because this mouse was so exhausted, it just laid there on the side of the can panting. So I just held it out like this in the can, and I carried the can downstairs and out the front door in my bathrobe, and then I laid the mouse on the front lawn. I went back in the house, and I showered, and I got dressed and ready for work, and I thought, this is something. You know, in the moral equation, this is something on the right side for once. And when I walked out of the house, I looked at the spot where I had put the mouse on the lawn because I wanted to get that good feeling again, that feeling of, yes, you've done something for the positive today. And as soon as I looked, I learned something. <laughs> you see, there's a difference between bugs and mice. You can put a bug outside in any weather. But before you put a wet mouse on your front lawn, make sure it's above freezing. <laughs> I made a mousicle. <laughs> so, I don't know where I fall in the moral <laughs> equation at this point. I guess I demonstrated that I'm not a hypocrite. <laughs> or maybe I'm more of a hypocrite for killing mice while I apologize to them. I still work on malaria, but not with mice. I'm, I'm working on a vaccine for malaria that I truly actually think is going to start saving lives in the next five years, human lives. I, I hope, I hope, please. <laughs> Let us all hope. And I think, for my sake, it had better. <laughs> because in the grand moral tally, the only thing I know for certain is that I am already 262 mice in the hole. Thank you very much.